Hey guys, I know what you're thinking right now. This is not the way the service normally starts. I know that, but I wanted to make sure that we're all operating from the same mindset, the same thought process, the same position. You know, what I read in scripture over and over is how God leads his people, you and I, and then in the Bible, how he led people was not by removing things that were troubling them in their life, but making them stronger so that they could live through it victoriously. It wasn't the removal of obstacles. It was learning how to be strong, learning how to be steadfast, and, and learning how to be more than, let's say, winners. There's a scripture, and I want to tell you a, a little story. Uh, the Apostle Paul is talking to the church at Rome, who was really, Rome was seen as like the epicenter of the Roman Empire. It was like New York and London and Los Angeles all wrapped up into one. Very cosmopolitan, many different people, uh, types of people lived there. But the whole idea was the Roman oppression started in the city of Rome. Well, there's a church there and Paul begins to speak to this church about the difficulty of living out the Christian life because of things that were happening to them externally. Kind of like what's going on between you and I right now with this whole COVID-19 season. There's an external factor that's making it hard for us to really sometimes have faith in God or where is God or to be strong in our faith through seasons like this. Well, Paul goes on to tell them that one of the reasons why you can be a winner, you can win, you can be victorious is because God gave his life for us. But Paul also begins to tell the Roman church there. He says, now, not only did he give his life for us, but there's actually nothing that can separate you from God. And then he makes this statement in Romans chapter eight that, listen, he works all things to the good. All things for God, they all work to God's goodness and for us. They all work to our good. But then Paul makes this statement, and remember who he's talking to. He's talking to the church that is being absolutely decimated by outside experiences, outside external factors that are making it difficult for them to serve God. But he doesn't tell them things to do. He makes sure he tells them who they are. He says all things work together for, for the good, for God's people, for those who know, know God, live by God. They understand who he is. They've accepted him. Listen to me. He says this. He says he doesn't tell them here are three steps. He first tells them who they are. He turns around and tells them, you are more than conquerors. He tells them who they are. He doesn't tell them what to do because it first starts with a mindset. And that's the kind of mindset I want us to have today is we are more than conquerors. He, Paul could have said, listen, you're winners. Listen, you're going to be victorious. He said, you're more than a winner. You're a conqueror a conqueror. You're, you're more than conquerors. It would be like this. It'd be like uh, being in a basketball game and one team uh, scores 111 points and another team scores six. They just didn't win. They were more than winners. And what Paul goes on to say is that those who know God are more than conquerors because what they do is they understand the benefits in the battle. They just don't win, they grow in the battle. So with, for you and I, remember, we are more than conquerors because God is on our side. Not only do we win, but we learn from the season we're in. And one of the things we're learning is to trust and to know him deeper in a deeper way. You, me, we, we're more than conquerors. So now, no matter where you are, your kitchen or your living room, if you're driving, if you're whatever it is, wherever you are now from the same mindset that God gave us now, let's worship together. Sing a new song. 
to let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy and let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety oh, let it rise We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything We sing with all we are and we claim your victory Oh, let it rise Let praise arise oh. We'll see you break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall Fear cannot survive Yeah. 
cross All for the Savior We are alive for your grace In earth and sky No one is higher Our God of wonders you reign hey, Our God of wonders you reign Give him the praise he's worthy of. God, we throw off our chains so we can give you all the praise. Nothing getting in the way of all you worthy of, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 
Come on, every voice, sing not to us, but to your name. Not to us, but to your name. We lift up all praise. It's not to us, but to your name. We lift up all praise. Come on and shout it out. Not to us, but to your name. Chapel family, it's so great to be worshiping with you today. My name is Pastor Jason. I'm one of your pastors here at the chapel. We're going to continue to worship in just a minute, but I want to encourage you. The next song that we're about to sing reminds us that the name of Jesus is the name above all names. You know that anything that you and I will ever face in this life will have a name. So whatever we were struggling with before COVID-19, whether it was a difficult relationship, a difficult circumstance, the name of Jesus is above all those names. COVID-19 is a name, but the name of Jesus is higher, it's stronger, it's more powerful. And something that should give us such great hope and joy and confidence is the fact that whatever comes next, when coronavirus is over and we get back to some kind of sense of normal, there will be something that comes next that will try to rob us of our peace, something that will try to bring anxiety and fear but the name of Jesus will be above those names too. He's gonna to be above those names too. So listen, his name is above any sickness. It's above any disease. His name is above any cancer. His name is above every shame, every guilt, every feeling of rejection, every feeling of depression. His name is above. No matter what you and I will ever face, the name of Jesus is the name above every other name. So wherever you're watching from today, Let's worship together. Let's sing with a loud voice and let's lift up the most beautiful, the most wonderful and the most powerful name of Jesus. Let's worship together.
on, let's sing this too. The death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boats of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are Hey guys, well, it looks like we might actually be seeing some light at the end of the tunnel, the light at the end of this whole coronavirus season. And I don't know if you're like me, but what has happened is I keep hearing this one word over and over uh, from county officials, state officials, the federal government, this word testing over and over. We hear testing, we gotta have more testing. We gotta make sure people are tested. And for sure, we wanna make that a priority in our community. But I just wanna share something just for a few minutes about this word testing, because it's actually not new. We just hear it a lot now, but let's dive in for a few minutes into scripture. And I wanna look at what the Bible says about about testing. And right off the bat in James chapter one, the half brother of Jesus, it says this, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way. So troubles of any kind, which we would say right now, all of the trouble that this Corona season is creating, it's creating so many problems in our community, in our relationships, even in our spiritual life. But he says this, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And one of the first things you notice that testing, about testing, when, when the Bible talks about the testing in our lives, these tests, these, these outside things that are happening around us, one of the first things that James wants us to know is to know that it has an actual purpose. 
that testing has a purpose. James says, he talks about a mindset. He talks about a couple of things we'll cover, but I want to because we keep hearing the word testing over and over in our community, over and over in, in, our, in pop culture right now. So I wanna make sure that we have the right perspective, we have the right mindset about testing in our lives. These outside troubles or these outside problems, they have a tendency to test us. But if we're not careful, if we're not deliberate, these problems and these troubles will come on us and they act, we, we might actually start to think that God is doing this to us, that something, something that we are going through, God is doing to us. But what we find right away in scripture is James says these troubles are coming. These testings are coming. Not God doesn't use the test and the problem as something that's done to us. He uses the tests and the problems to do something in us. And that's an immediate perspective change. And I want to say that again. It's not that God is doing something to us in these testings or these problems. What he's doing, he takes the testing and the problems and he works things out. So it's not to us, he works things out in us. So one of the things we see right away in scripture when it talks about the testing, these problems that are happening around our life that they test our faith, that it's that problems have purpose, right? Well, one of the purposes, it actually works problems and troubles that are around us and happening around us that we actually can't control. What, what it serves is almost like a gauge for our faith. James says that uh, when you experience troubles of any kind, it's, it's to know that it's an opportunity, consider it an opportunity for the testing of your faith so it's got a purpose. It has a purpose. The, 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 the problems are a test for us to really see what we're made of in terms of our faith. What it works is a gauge to really understand how am I responding to these problems? So the first thing we see is that it kind of makes us kind of look inside because that's actually what testing does, right? Testing reveals things. Tests reveal what we know. It reveals on what we know on the inside. And I don't know anybody who loves testing. And I, and I know every student right now is saying, what? We all get to pass, no one can fail, and no final exam can I get? Thank you, Jesus, right there. So, so no one likes testing, because sometimes it can make us feel insecure. Sometimes testing can make us feel you know, like we, we don't know what we're doing. But in God's economy, it has a purpose. In God's economy, it tests our, the test of our faith is for us to understand of areas that we need to work on in our relationship with Christ. So immediately a gauge, immediately problems have purpose, immediately we know that nothing is done to us, it's done to work something out in us. Let's think of it like this. Faith is like a muscle and muscles grow because of resistance. If we were never to have any sort of adversity, what James is saying in our life, how would we have the gauge on where we trust God and where we are having trouble trusting God? So the idea, what James is saying is, you need to consider this kind of thought. It's actually a great opportunity. Absolutely, it's tough. Absolutely, we have hard times. Absolutely, it's kind of, uh, uh, it, it can kind of challenge us, like, where are you, God? But the perspective should also simultaneously be, God is working something out in me because problems have purpose. It tests our faith to see where, where what areas of our life that we need to work on. Here's the simple question. It, it, it's, if testing reveals... If testing shows what's going on in the inside, it'd be a great time. I could argue this is a great time to ask a question, how much are we trusting God in this season? Even though we may see light at the end of the tunnel, how much are we trusting God right now and how controlled or manipulated are we by fear? Uh, how, how do we see purpose and is it really revealing some things about our relationship with God? Because according to scripture, that is one of the things because problems have purpose. Problems, the problems are there to work something out in us in our relationship with God. So we have to ask the question at least, how am I responding to the troubles and the problems that are around me? Is it just with fear and anxiety and worry? Those are normal emotions. There's nothing wrong with that, but they can't be so prevalent and strong that we're not driven by faith, we're driven by fear. 
The second thing that you notice about the scripture is that not only do problems have a purpose in God's economy, but problems produce things. James says, don't you know that the testing, these how we're being tested to see where our faith is because of these problems, what it does is it reveals also, but it produces in us this endurance. Endurance, the word there means strength to carry on. So immediately, it's just not a problem. Although the problem exists, we don't ignore it. But it's there to do something in us, and it's to produce. Problems produce in God's economy. Here, specifically, endurance, the strength and the ability to carry on. See, it's, it's, it's this strength that we gain when we are in troubled times, when we have problems created by things that we had no control over. But James is saying, be sure you have the right mindset. God's not doing this to you. God's using it to work something out in you. He's saying that problems have purpose, but problems also produce. They produce, here's the thing I wanna tell you. Every single crisis that you've been in, every single situation that you thought was unbearable, every single calamity and hardship that we're walking through, everything that has ever happened to us, we have a 100% success rate. We survive. How I know is because you're watching the weekend service at the chapel. So we have that ability and you and I will make it through all of this with God because in God's economy, there's always purpose and there's always being something produced by troubles, hardships, issues that are happening around our life. Okay, so here's the thing. This is what I want us to understand. This is what I want us to get. So, so if we understand in God's economy that, that nothing is being done to us, God takes the problems and the issues and he works out something in us. But they, they have purpose and then they produce things. But, but it's not what we know that makes a difference. It's what we know and apply to our life. So when any time I learn something from the Bible, what I want to know is, so what, 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 how do I use it on Mondays? We call it the Monday test. How do I use it to change my life? How do I use it to affect, you know, my relationships around me? So here's the thing. Now that we know that, I always go, so how am I supposed to behave now? Now that I know that problems are, are there and God's using them, don't ignore them. Don't stick your hand, your head in the sand. But I want to know, so how do I behave? How, what does this mean for me? And it's actually, the answer is still in the first three verses of James chapter one. James says, consider this, consider at this an opportunity. What's this? Consider all of these troubles, consider it. The idea of consider is in its true meaning means to flip your thinking. Just don't think of the problem and having to, why is this being done to me? What are we gonna do? What's gonna happen? Consider this an opportunity. So really what James is saying is he says, don't look at it as just an obstacle, but just look at it as, listen, Don't. it's just not an obstacle, it's an opportunity. If you just see an obstacle, if you look at the coronavirus and the coronavirus season, this whole thing, as an obstacle, you'll be overwhelmed with anxiety when are we going to get back to normal? Phase one, phase two, you can do this, but you can't do that. 10 people, 20 people, but six, six, six feet apart. It's so, con they don't even know what phase one and two means. It's so confusing. But if you see it as an opportunity, you're complete. It's a paradigm shift. That's why James says, just don't react. Take a minute and consider. Take a minute and think through how this can be used, how God is using this to work something out in you. Here's what I know about, about my life, just like yours, that if I'm not considering, uh, I might just react to just the problems. But really, James is saying, no, consider, flip your thinking, and, and know that something else is at work. God is at work. God has got purpose for it. God has something that he's producing in us, that endurance, so that we'll learn and be stronger, so the next battle we fight, we're even stronger, right? But, but watch, if we don't see this season as an opportunity, he says, consider, flip your thinking, it's an opportunity. An opportunity, maybe the opportunity is found in, maybe we realize that we have 
have to reprioritize our lives. Maybe the, 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 the blessing in the whole thing is the idea that we value something again that was lost because of, of busyness and just the pace of life. It, he's saying maybe the opportunity that we're afforded right now along simultaneously with it causing problems is the idea that maybe we have all of a sudden found uh, what is the meaning to what makes us really, really fulfilled. See, what James wants to make sure right at the beginning of the chapter is that we're not lost in the problem, that we're not lost in the problem and, and that we don't see God working in the problem. That's one of the reasons why he says, consider it an opportunity for joy. And man, when I hear that, that idea of joy in the midst of this season, although we're in the middle and we may be seeing the light at the end of this COVID-19 thing, but it, he says joy, even when I read it, I, I still go, ah, it's so difficult. But joy, listen, I wanna make sure everybody understands, it's not joyful because of the problem, it's joyful in the problem. Don't rejoice, don't be joyful uh, because you have problems, be joyful in the problem. Because in the problems, well, there's purpose. In the problems, God is producing things in us. In the problems, God is still working. And we said 100% of the crises that you and I have been through, we've successfully navigated. See, it's about considering it's an opportunity, not an obstacle. You see, what James really wants us to understand is just don't look at the problems. He, said, he says, consider it, flip your mind, there's something else, change your thinking, new thinking, there's something else working. It's just not a problem, it's just not an obstacle, it's an opportunity. And so here's this great story that I wanna tell you. It's, it's the early 1900s. Uh, and there's a young man who has this passion for building. He has this passion for carpentry. Well, he's working at a sawmill and what happens is the Great Depression comes upon uh, the whole entire country. He loses his job. So he's in something that he's really wanting to do. He's in something learning and he loses his job. What happens is he comes home and he tells his wife, he says, honey, listen, things are bad. And he's not only supporting his family, but he's also supporting his extended family. And what happens is he says, honey, I've lost my job. She immediately turns around and says, now what are we going to do? And with just a moment of pause, this young man turns around and says, well, I'm gonna use this as a chance to pursue something I've always wanted to do. So he takes the family's savings, which is about eighteen, nineteen hundred dollars $1,900. And he takes out a small loan and he goes and pursues his passion for building bigger buildings. He meets another young man with the same passion and that person who told his wife that he was gonna use what was happening, the obstacle that most would see, he was gonna use it as a chance and an opportunity to pursue something he always wanted to do was Wallace E. Johnson, one of the founders of the Holiday Inn. What I love about this story is that it wasn't like Wallace ignored what was happening. It wasn't like he ignored the problems, but he didn't let it overwhelm, well, overwhelm him. What he did is he saw it also as an opportunity, an opportunity to pursue something that he knew that God had put in his heart. The Holiday Inn was also the very first hotel chain to place Bibles in every single room. And when you do the reading about Wallace Johnson, you'll find that he said it was God who strengthened him in all of the tough times to make him strong for all of the battles that he was going to face later on in life. You see, it just isn't an obstacle, it's an opportunity. It's not something being done to us, it's God using things to work things in us so that we would be stronger in whatever we face. That's you, that's me. It's always an opportunity. God's always doing something with everything. I love you guys. I miss you. We'll see each other really soon. Thanks for joining us for service today. It's been an honor to serve you. We wanted to open up an opportunity for you to continue your worship experience through giving. There are three very simple, quick, and secure ways available to you right now. 
First, text to give. Compose a text with keyword thechapel.cc with your gift amount to 77977. Hit send and complete the prompts. Also, you can give through our website, thechapel.cc slash give. If you'd like to give the old-fashioned way, you can always mail in a check to 1324 Seven Springs Boulevard, Suite Number 363, Newport Ritchie, Florida, 34655. We've got so much to do in these coming weeks and months, and it's great that we can do it together. Thank you for your continued generosity.